and actually just treating you like my seventh graders. Um, because uh, Dr. Rappenchuk was like, I thought you were just gonna do a sample lesson. I want them to feel like they're the seventh graders sitting in the room and you're just gonna do your lesson and we're gonna do the lesson with the seventh grade. So I think that's how I'll try to run it, but I'll just be honest with you. I am super tempted to just stop and go, now sometimes I do this and sometimes I do that. And so if I do that, please forgive me. I'll try to stick with the fact that you're my seventh grade class. How does that sound? So you've all just come in. Okay, you've all just come in to Mrs. Carey's pro gym class on a Tuesday after a late night volleyball game and I'll probably look at you and say, turn the light, big lights on because I've got the other ones. I'm like, no. So you're probably tired. But anyway, um, what the way that I start is with a song. So gentlemen, here is your part of the song and you can catch on and sing with me whenever you're ready. Here's how it goes. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. That's all it is. Are you ready? Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. That was lovely. Guys, you are awesome. You should be in choir all the time. Ladies, here's our part. We say, after they're finished, we say, I want to go there. Can you hear that? I want to go there. And then we sing, heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. I want to go there. Heaven is a wonderful Catching on. Okay, ladies, let's try our part one time. Here we go. I want to go there. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. I want to go there. Heaven. Okay, so junior high kids, right? Sorry, I'm slipping out of my teacher to the seventh grade student moment. Love this. And it gets them awake, right? It's the point of focusing, focusing them on what we are called to, what we are made for, and that we should be awake. So let's try to put the boys and girls together. Here we go. Here we go. Guys, I'll start with you, and then we'll add the ladies. We can do it. We can do it. Here, guys. Here we go. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. I want to go there. Heaven is a wonderful, a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. I want to go there. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. Yeah, you guys did it. See, you learned a new song. If nothing else from this workshop, you've got a song to sing with your kids. <laughs> All right, so then after I kind of get them awake and chuckling like some of you are doing, then um, I choose someone to pray for us, to focus our minds on the lesson that God has for us in writing. So who would like to pray for us to focus our minds on the lesson that God has for us in writing today? Thank you, sir. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for being our Father in heaven, and we are in recognition of that. And we're humbled before your presence, and I just pray that we glorify you in all that we do and all that we learn, and uh, bless the workers well to uh, impart wisdom and knowledge upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm, amen. Thank you so much. Have to get closer. Bryce. Thank you, Bryce. That was a lovely prayer. All right, so um, we are going to learn about something super exciting to all of you today. We're going to learn about arguing. And honestly, I've heard some of you argue and you do it quite well. Um, so we're going to let some of you use that talent in our opening discussion. And I don't know if you noticed, but when we came up to where we are in this building, you may have had to walk some stairs. And there's a reason for that because right now the elevator is being fixed. In fact, if you went this, this way that we normally go where the elevator is, you would look down and see a dark gaping hole and possibly be scared like I am because I'm scared of heights. And, uh, <clears throat> and so what I want to talk about today is what do you think? Do you agree that elevators are more helpful than stairs? What do you think, seventh graders? Are elevators more helpful than stairs? I know some of you have used this elevator in our building many times to carry things up and down that I've asked you to put in my van, um, to get ready for different uh, exciting things that we've had like Narnia Day. So what do you think? What is your opinion? You can just 
share aloud. It's an open discussion. You can raise your hand and tell me, um, are elevators actually more helpful than stairs? And if so, why? What do you mean by that? Um, I mean that helpfulness is referring to what helps you in a given moment. Like what are mm. you mm. And so the helpfulness of elevators or stairs just depends specifically on each context. How heavy is the thing? Are you in a hurry? In a hurry, run up the stairs. Mm. Some people are heavy, take an elevator. If you're disabled, take an elevator. Mm. So I would say that the answer is that's a yeah, it's a false dilemma. Why? Because it depends on things that I don't actually list up there. I don't tell you the details. I don't tell you more about it. I'm speaking in seventh grade terms. I think probably my seventh graders would not have come back with that, but I think that's great because they're in the middle of logic and learning about false dilemmas right now. Um, so great, great. Um, in your own opinion, could you uh, put yourself in a uh, situation where you feel that elevators are more helpful than stairs? And if so, what would that situation be? But you just gave us a couple of examples. Well, that would be my grandma, John, who has back problems and needs to use the elevator because she is a English teacher and carries all sorts of stuff to her classroom. Okay, so you might come in with a, a, another claim that says, my, to my grandma, Johnny, an elevator is more helpful than stairs. And so you might want to be more specific about that, okay? And then you could tell me why. Good, so that you would make that claim. Good. What else? Can anybody... Have, think of a counterclaim for that. Can anyone say, no, actually stairs are more helpful than elevators in certain situations and maybe describe the situation there where st stairs would be more helpful. Can anybody think of so a another claim, a counterclaim? We could say that stairs are more helpful than elevators because they help us rely on each other and we have to have a partner to get our work done and we use the stairs instead of the elevator. Okay, so if I'm trying to carry a big heavy item up the stairs, it's going to it's gonna cause me to have to ask someone for help. And so I reach out and realize that two are better than one. And so that can be helpful in that manner. Okay, so you're making another claim. Hey, wait a minute. Stairs could actually be more helpful in this instance, right? And so you're giving me more details. That's great. Anybody else have another claim about whether an elevator would be more helpful in a certain situation or whether stairs would be more helpful in a certain situation? When coming to class, stairs would be more beneficial. Okay. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, it gets your blood pumping, it gets your heart going. Ah. Your, your blood is moving, you're ready to go. Mm. You have more energy going through you. So. Yeah, it gets you ready. It helps with your health. It helps with the health of your heart, right? It's more um, healthy for you. So when you're if you say that helpful means that it keeps you healthier, then definitely you would have a case to make for stairs. And so what I would do, just with lack of time, slipping out of my teacher mode, we would talk through all those. I might even throw some up on the board and have kids, you know. Um, the one that I use the most, I, I put in my notes, is which is ba better, basketball or volleyball. So you know, find something they're very passionate about and they're going to start shouting out reasons why basketball is better, reasons why volleyball is better. And then we have to talk through that logically. Okay, but do you need to give us more details? And as we do that, I, I put on this little sheet here for you guys, just these definitions. You guys probably all know those definitions. Those are the ones I use. You can use, uh, you know, variant ones that kind of show kids and introduce them to this. So this sample lesson is just a basic introduction. This is the first time I've ever talked about refuting any, anything with my kids while I'm teaching pro gym. And this lesson comes um, close to the beginning of the year, so they haven't had a lot of logic yet. In fact, our students specifically don't have formal logic until eighth grade. So they're, I'm just kind of prepping them with terms and vocabulary at this point um, and, and having them use these words. And so as we're having this discussion about whether the elevator or the stairs are, are uh, the preference and why, then I might say something like, oh, can you refute that? And then have someone come back and, and experience what it means to refute something. And what is the difference in refutation and refute? And then we're going back to grammar to use these terms and say, well, one of them is a noun and one of them is a verb, and here's why. Um, I, I use the word claim. You made a claim and you made a counterclaim. So just getting them used to the vocabulary, right? And I didn't want you to have to feel like you had to write that stuff down. You probably already know them in your mind, but there's a little slip that has this if you want them. So once we, that's just the anticipatory set, getting kids kind of into debating, arguing, uh, discussing, and using the vocabulary there. And then I would go on um, to, to write these on the board. My students, just to kind of uh, echo what Dr. Clark said earlier, every, everything that I have my students do is not out of a pre 
made workbook or book, they have a writing notebook. I want them to have to write it down so I write it down in front of them with them because that forces me to slow down. That forces them to think about what's on the board. They're not allowed to talk. They, I want them to meditate on what words we're writing and what they mean. So I would write the steps as I have them here, right in front of the students. They'd get their notebooks out. They would know it's time to write. You know that uh, seventh, eighth grade, uh, those years are super, um, it's crucial, right, to get them to start taking notes and, and going a little quicker and a little quicker. So every time I do it, I go a little quicker and a little quicker to get them kind of on that, you know, same page so that they're ready for high school. So then um, we would talk through these words. We would just say them together. So let's do that right now. We would say, discredit, exposition, unclarity, implausibility, impossibility, inconsistency, impropriety, inexpediency, and epilogue. And many of my kids look at me like, you are speaking a different language. Like they, they don't know. They've never seen any of these words. They don't know what they mean. And so then I tell them, hey, you know what? Today is all about giving you tools to put in your toolbox to get ready to be able to stand up and have a good argument with someone in order to persuade them to think a certain way or do a certain thing. And so that gets them all excited, right? They want to be able to persuade. Um, and so then I say, these are the tools, right? If you look at these and you memorize these and you think on these and you practice these, then the whole point is for you to be able to, I don't know, sit in a Chick-fil-A one day and you've got someone that you're talking to and you're trying to lead them to a knowledge of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you can start thinking through the arguments and refuting false statements that that person is, is trying to uphold um, in a loving manner, of course. And so it's this idea that I'm constantly going back to because the kids always want to pigeonhole it to their writing assignment. This is writing. This is just about an assignment that I turn in and get a grade for. No, that's not what this is, right? Um, so it's always, always going back to the, the idea that I'm giving you tools to think like a rhetorician and to communicate like a rhetorician. That's why we do this writing assignment. So then we come up and uh, tr the first step, after they have written them down and they have to say them with me, uh, much like Dr. Clark did, then we memorize them, just like he, all speech that moves men, right? So I usually have songs for that and I have a song today, so you've noticed I sing a lot. Sorry, that's just how I am, that's how I teach. So uh, uh, we're gonna learn this song today for refutation steps. Um, and it's to the tw tune of Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, okay? And it sounds like this. Nine steps to a refutation, refutation has nine steps. Nine steps to a refutation, refutation has nine steps. One discredit, two exposition, three is unclarity. Four, implausibility. Five, impossibility. Six is inconsistency. Seven is impropriety. Eight is inexpediency. And number nine is epilogue. Okay, basic and simple, right? But they know it, they love it. We sing it every day from then on. Okay, we sing that one. We sing our Kreya song. They know the steps, right? Even if they kind of forget exactly what the step is, they at least have the step in their mind to go, oh, what could I do here? Oh, well, I could do implausible or impossible or inexpedient, right? Those kinds of things. So let's sing. Stand up. Let's sing it together. Just one time. We could do it. It's fun. It'll get your blood going just like the stairs, right? That was the, that was the uh, argument for that. Here we go. Nine steps to a refutation. Refutation has nine steps. Nine steps to a refutation. Refutation has nine steps. One discredit to exposition. Three is unclarity. Four impossibility. Five impossibility. Six is inconsistency, seven is impropriety, eight is inexpediency, and number nine is epilogue. See, super simple. The kids catch on quick, and it places it in their head where they have to hear it even in, the, in their sleep. But sometimes they're like, I can't get that sign out of my head. I'm like, yay, that's great. Um, so after we've learned the steps, I mean, this seems so basic and simple. I know it seems like kindergarten stuff, but really it's about... Skole. It's about taking the time to slow down and really meditate on, right, and think about what we're doing here. So after we do that and they have a little fun, it, I feel like it's safe enough to have them sit down without 
uh, having them fall asleep, especially if it's my <laughs> afternoon class, right? And then we they get out their notebooks and we just start talking. And that's the time where they take notes. And you guys may be familiar. I don't know how familiar you are with reputations and how much you know about the steps. But I will talk to them about some real basic and simple things. And so I'll say your discredit is basically your introduction to your paper, okay? And the way that I make it manageable for incoming seventh graders, okay, this is at their level, is I'll say we need one basic general statement, okay? It needs to be very general. We're not even saying the name of the story that we're refuting yet, okay? Um, we are just going to make a general statement about all types of stories, these types of stories, or about these types of authors, okay? And so then I'll write that in and I'll have them writing, writing this down in their journals. So it's a general statement about these authors or these stories, okay? And then the second part of your discredit, okay, is your thesis statement, right? And in your thesis that you're trying to argue, this claim that you're trying to make, it's also going to be somewhat general. And the reason it's going to be somewhat general is because uh, without fail, every time we start a refutation, um, the students want to jump down here to details and use the details for their thesis. And so I tell them, okay, if, if they use something that's very detailed, like, um, you know, so-and-so is very unclear because I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, we have a step that we're going to prove how it's unclear but let's just make a general negative statement because this is a refutation. We're refuting someone. We're refuting a story here, right? Um, so it's a general negative statement proving that something is bad, but it's a general negative statement about a specific story. So they're actually gonna write the title in this, of the story in this statement, right? Okay, something like, uh, what do you want to pick today just to talk through? We've got a story that we're going to do together in a minute. Let's, let's pick Cinderella, okay? So if we're talking about Cinderella, and I do that a lot, I'll have the kids just pick a story that they know really well so that it's something that they've chosen. Uh, and I'll say, oh, okay, uh, fairy tales confuse readers and breed immorality. Now, that's a general statement about all of these types of stories or about all of these authors. I could have said authors of fairy tales confuse readers and freedom morality, right? So I could say it about the authors, I could say about the stories, but it's a general statement that opens the audience up to what you're about to talk about, okay? And after that one general statement, then I say, okay, now you need a thesis that's gonna bring it in a little bit and we need to know what story or what author you're talking about. And so they'll say something like, you know, the author of Cinderella, Hmm, let me think through this. What's a strong verb? I don't let them say is, right? I don't let, they have to, they have to choose a strong verb. So it, they could say something like, the author of Cinderella twists young minds, okay? They could choose any kind of strong verb, but that's a very general statement. It doesn't tell us how it twists young minds, um, that kind of thing. So we're looking for a general statement about all of this type of story, if it's a fairy tale or if it's whatever it is, right, fiction. And we're, then we're looking for a general thesis about this particular story. But it needs to be general in that um, they're making an overall claim that they're going to prove that it twists young minds using these steps, right? So whatever their claim is has to be proven through these steps. Um, and, and that kind of makes it manageable. Now, there are other things, of course, it can be longer than two sentences. But when I first introduced this, I find that the biggest struggle that my kids have is if I take them through a book which this book is awesome, Classical Composition. I don't know if you guys have used this. But when I start taking them through this book, what happens is they get stuck on each little bitty way that they could do thing and each little bitty type of stuff. And they lose the overall understanding and focus of the big picture of a refutation. And when we get finished, all they know is, well, on this step I did this, and on this step I had to do this. And they don't really realize what they've done or why they've done it. And so this is my attempt at saying, okay, I'm gonna introduce this in a way that you can see the big picture before we start zeroing in on smaller things like figures of description, or did you use a rhetorical question here, or where's your counterclaim? All of that will come, but it comes later because I want them to understand what they're writing first. So I only require them to have those two sentences. And if they are crafted well, okay, and they don't have any dead words, I have words that they're not allowed to use, which you guys probably do, um, and they have a, a thesis statement and they're able to support that statement with all of these tools that they're going to learn how to use, then that's good for the, for the beginning, right? This is the beginning lesson. Okay, then we go into the exposition, which is 
uh, the paraphrase or the retelling. And the paraphrase and the retelling, um, if your student has had progen before, they've had narrative, and there are nine components, right? Now, something else that trips up my students is that they have narrative, they've had narrative, they've written narratives in the past. They come in and they say, okay, so my exposition has to be nine components. And what they automatically do is they go, okay, my recognition is this, and my reversal is this, and they try to put it in order. And they're not actually paraphrasing the story. They're not telling a story. They're just listing things from the story. So they're confused. And so I don't actually tell them to use the nine components when I tell them to use the exposition, when I, when I tell them to write their exposition. I say, retell the story as if you're telling it to a first grader. What do they need to know to understand the story? Okay, what are the important parts of the story? So my seventh graders can like, oh yeah, I can do that. I can retell it in my own words as if I'm telling the story, you know, after they've read the story. And after they write their exposition, I come in and say, now use the nine components to make sure you have all the good parts. I mean, what, what's hard about summarizing and what's hard about paraphrasing is that kids don't know what to include and not to include, right? So that's really what the nine components are for, is so that they can check and see, did I include recognition? Did I include reversal? Did I include suffering? And then the agent, the action, the time, the place, the manner, and the cause? If I've got all those things in there somewhere, I'm good, right? So it's like they already know beginning, middle, and end. They already know how to paraphrase and retell a story. And if I give them nine components, they get confused and think they have to do it in a different order. And they don't. The nine components are just there so that they can check to make sure they had all the important things in there, right? That they didn't leave out something big that their audience is going to go, but what about this? Well, what about that? The other thing I will mention right here besides the nine components, does anybody want me to list the nine components? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm just not sure how far along you are in Pro Gym, and I don't want to confuse anybody, but I also don't want to bore you, right? <laughs> Do what? Okay, all right, so here they are. Uh, recognition, and here's another chant that we do. Recognition, reversal, suffering, agent, action, time, place, manner, cause. Recognition, reversal, suffering, agent, action. So they know, right, by the time they get to uh, seventh grade, they've got them in their minds. And if you just want to get me your email, I can send you this so you don't have to write it all down. It's up to you. I'm, I'm happy to send all the stuff I have. So uh, when they're learning the step of narrative, they learn these nine components. And that we do that in fourth grade here at SFO. But, you, and, but we also repeat it in every grade so that they're practicing that as they get up to me in seventh grade. So in seventh grade, unless we have a new kid, which I'll have to hand out and say, OK, here's our chant. Here's we practice. And send them on their way and expect them to come back in knowing it. That's just, yeah, I mean, you guys know we all deal with that, don't we? Um, and so then they have these in their minds. So like I said before, if I say write this, I'm kind of telling you the mistakes I've made <laughs> in the past. If I say write this using this, they're confused. So I don't tell them that at the beginning. I say paraphrase the story. Retell the story in your own words like you would you know, tell it to a first grader. Then I go back and say, OK, now use your nine components to check and make sure. Do you have recognition? Is there something that your audience can recognize and relate to? Do you have reversal? Does someone who's low now become high? Someone who's high now become low? Do you have suffering? Yes, it's the, you know, the suffering in Cinderella is evident, right? We'll go back to Cinderella. Um, do you have an agent? Yes, it's Cinderella and her sisters and her mother, stepmother and all that. Uh, what's the action, time, place, manner, cause? All of these just line up with characters and setting and um, the how, right, and the why, right? So that's what you're looking for with all these. They're kind of self-explanatory. But it makes kids think, and it makes them analyze what they've already seen. So there's just so many skills going on as you're doing reputation with these kids, right? All right, so then after you've got it retold, it's on clarity. Um, I will stop and do a side note on exposition. When, when the kids have written their reputations, let's say they've refuted Cinderella, the next um, assignment is to confirm it. And then I, I require them to confirm the same thing they've just refuted, of course. Um, because they have to look at that and go, okay, now how could I say that actually is clear? How could I say that actually is plausible or it is, is possible, those kinds of things? Um, so debate, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just building that skill. Uh, but in a confirmation that they write, they don't do the exposition. Does anybody know why? Why would you tell the exposition in a reputation, but you wouldn't tell it in a confirmation? What do you think? I, I think it's because you, you sort of set up in the exposition, sort of set up the stuff that you're going to tear down about it. So in a confirmation, you're just sort of telling, you're telling the story throughout the, so it's really just eight steps. So you, you're telling the story, kind of. And in a yeah. reputation, you say, here's what they say about this. Sure. 
and then you kind of pull back. Absolutely. So the nature of it is you have to have their claim there before you can make a counterclaim, right? And the other one is you're really just making a claim. You're just going back and saying, yes, I agree with all these claims that they've said. So you're right. Um, another reason that the kids, I, I think, really enjoyed knowing about is this progymnosmata was preparing these rhetoricians, these early rhetoricians, to stand up in a court of law, right, and, and to uh, argue their case. And so who goes first in a court of law? Think about it. Is it, is it the prosecutor, the defendant? What happens in a court of law? Okay, and what do they have to say? They have to tell the story, right? They have to tell the story, right? And then when the other comes back, they don't have to retell the story, do they? The story's already been told. So the general idea is that's what this was for, right? So if the story's already been, if they've already stood up and argued the story at the beginning, then you don't have to retell the story when you come back to, you know, bring your counterclaims and say, no, this actually was right or this actually was okay to do. So the kids like that because it connects it with the real world. Oh, I get that. Yeah, I've seen shows where lawyers are up there, you know, and, I, you know, they don't have to retell it. Um, yeah. That's right. They like that too. <laughs> That's always a good thing too. You're right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so true. So true. Okay. So for all of the rest of these steps, okay, up until epilogue, okay, here's what you're doing. Here's what I require incoming seventh graders so that I, I am not totally um, blowing things out of the water for them and they're ready to move on to little details. This first part, I say, you are going to pick out something in the story, Cinderella, right, that is unclear. One thing that is unclear, right? And you're going to make that your thesis statement, right? Um, most of the time, uh, in order to avoid our dead words like is, you know, they can't say so-and-so is unclear, they, a lot of times they'll choose a, a rhetorical question for, uh, you know, for the beginning of their paragraph. So they'll say something like, how does Cinderella's shoe slip off her foot when she's running, but it fits her perfectly later when the prince puts it on? You know, How much sense does that make? That's very unclear, right? If it's a perfect fit, why would it slip off while she's running? Uh, and so, so, so they'll ask that question, right? And then I tell them, right? So you need the, the first sentence is going to be like your main idea, right? Your claim. And sometimes it can be in a question. They ask the, question, the rhetorical question, right? And then they need two reasons or, you know, two pieces of proof, I call them, because if I say proofs, then we get into something that's more <laughs> logical and they go, wait a minute. And I'm like, well, really, it's just we're making a statement. We're making a sentence that backs up or supports that claim. OK, so if you're saying something like, how does Cinderella's shoe slip off when it's actually a perfect fit? then they would have to come back and argue that logically in a way that they would know how to do at the seventh grade level. So they would have to say something like, um, you know, do people at shoe stores, da 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 you know, fit them in order for them to slip right back off as they're walking across, you know, before they even buy them. I mean, they can just kind of, you know, as long as they're supporting, hey, wait a minute, people don't do that. Like, that doesn't happen. If a shoe fits, it fits. And if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. And so if it came off, then it wouldn't have fit when the prince, you know, brought it back. So they have to have two more sentences. So I only require three total sentences on these certain steps because I have found that if I, I started this with, okay, now you need to make a claim and you need to come back with a counterclaim. Some might say that, yes, it can fit perfectly. However, you know, if your foot is at a certain angle, and you know, whatever, they can come back with a counterclaim. We get to all that, we will do that. Then I, I will say, after they have this rough draft and they bring it back to me, I say, okay, you said two reasons why shoes don't slip off. Now, how could somebody say that actually they would slip off? What would be the counterclaim and how do you come back and refute that, you know, counterclaim? Um, so we do that, but we don't do it at the beginning because I found if I do it at the beginning, the kids get so caught up in trying to figure out the terms claim and counterclaim because they haven't been introduced to a formal logic yet, that my kids don't really know that yet, that, that they forget what they're actually doing in the whole piece. They lose the focus of the whole piece. Um, so I say, give us a main idea and give us two reasons to support your main idea. They're either details uh, more about that reason or they're things that prove it to be true, right? Statements that prove it to be true. And I do that for implausibility. Now, the thing that they pick out that is unclear, they have to pick something different that's implausible because several things could fall in more than one category over here, right? Um, but I make them pick something else. And so essentially what they're doing is, what kids will want to do at this level is come in and say, 
Well, the whole story is unclear, and let me tell you why. This happens, and this happens, and this happens, and I say, slow down, right? If you want to prove something, right, to someone else, then you have to have good proof, good evidence, good information from the story, and good information from life that proves how things actually happen, and so you need to make one claim of something in the story that's unclear. That's it. And then tell me two reasons why. How can you prove that if you were actually arguing it? And then you need to come down here and say, well, it's implausible that a mother having two daughters of her own would be so cruel to another girl, you know, even if she's not her real daughter. Here's why it's implausible. Because mothers are like this and mothers do this and da 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 right? So they're just basically um, being introduced to this idea of pulling out the main idea and giving me reasons why. So I only... Um, I only require them. Can they do more? Yes. And do I have kids do way more? Absolutely. If they're ready for that, I want them to do that. But especially for my ones that are just being, figuring out what how to say reputation, you know what I'm saying? Like they need to be able to just keep it to three. We'll come down and pick out another, another one, impossibility. Well, it's impossible that a fairy godmother can show up and change something into pumpkin. And here's why, let me tell you. Well, because of physics and because matter and all these things, right? Um, inconsistency, that's one that uh, I will tell you something that has helped me with inconsistency. It can be two different kinds of inconsistency. Um, you could say, well, at first a character is acting a certain way and then they change. Why did they change, right? They're being inconsistent, right? And, and it changes sometime in the story. So they can claim, hey, this is inconsistent because this character was this way and now they're another way, right? But oftentimes you don't get that in a story. You don't necessarily have a character that will just change automatically and you go, what happened here? In fact, that's actually pretty rare, okay? So the other kind of inconsistency and the one that my kids use the most often is inconsistent with how someone is supposed to be in reality, a righteous version of whatever they are, whoever they are, right? So uh, like in Daedalus and Icarus, right? Uh, we write that one every year and my students will say something like, how does Daedalus allow his son to strap on wings and try to cross the ocean, they'll say, this is not what a father does, right? It's inconsistent with a father's role and who a father's actually supposed to be and how he's supposed to take care of his children. And so that one, if they can't find a character acting one way and changing to another, then it's always a character that acts inconsistently with, uh, with who they are, like what their position is, okay? A character that does not act like a father or a mother. Yep. Idea of what something should be specifically yep. in the story, it doesn't match. Absolutely. I think it also taps into uh, this idea of, you know, Dr. Clark talking about truth and talking about what's real, right? Well, what is real about a father? Well, we have the ultimate father and we can talk about what's real about a father. And if we have a character in our story who is not depicting the character of a real father, then we can say they're being inconsistent with what's real. You know, so I think that's a whole nother level you're tapping in on there that actually probably teaches the kids a whole lot more than just somebody was acting one way and they switched to a different way. Um, so yeah, and same with mothers. You know, we have, uh, uh, we do one on, I'm trying to think of, oh, I'm not gonna think of, the, it's like the ancient Greek tale of, uh, it's not Aphrodite and the Rose, we do that one. But we also do the one of the nymph, the nymph who runs and gets turned into the tree. What's her name? It's gone, it's not in my mind. What? I know, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, yes. She runs, she gets turned into a tree, what's her name? Ah, ah. Anyway, whatever it is, we talk about how if Earth is her mother, you know, why, why does Earth choose to act the way that she does? You know, why does she turn her into this tree? Or why do, a mother would want, back then, a mother would want her daughter to marry someone, you know, like that. A mother would want her daughter to have a, a, a god for her, husband. And so that's silly that the mother would turn her into a tree so that she wouldn't have to marry the God, you know? So it's just the idea of anything that goes against the idea of what a mother actually would have been then is not consistent with the idea of what a mother was. And so then we can say it's inconsistent. So Daphne, that's it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. And Apollo, that's it. Daphne, Apollo. Good. All right. So that's inconsistency. Impropriety um, is, you know, you all probably know, it's anything that you can argue that's unrighteous or sinful in the story, right? 
So they're claiming, hey, you know, this was not okay that the stepmother treated Cinderella like this. You know, what mother does this? Now, if they used the stepmother for inconsistency, then they probably can't use that for impropriety and they'll have to choose something else. The kids are like, ah, I already used it, you know, and they have to think about something else. But they're claiming that something is unrighteous. It's sinful and here's why. Um, and in expediency is anything that's not helpful. And I always use the example that Paul talks about spreading the gospel in the most expedient manner. And so I look at the kids and say, is it a sin then to take a plane and fly over to Africa to tell people about Christ? And they're like, no, what are you talking about? I'm like, but Paul didn't have a plane. He didn't take a plane. So probably we can't take a plane. And they're like, oh, I get it. It's anything that's helpful in any helpful way. You know, Paul had to walk around a lot. Paul had to get on ships a lot, but we have other ways that we can do it. So in any helpful, expedient manner. And so we talk about that a little bit. And then um, we talk about what was, what do you think was absolutely valueless in the story? What was not helpful for the reader? right? So they'll read through and go, oh, well, it doesn't really matter that I knew that so-and-so was wearing a red shirt. Who cares if they had a red shirt on? Does that really help me? Da, 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 or whatever. That's just kind of a silly example. But there are a lot of things in stories where you say, does it really matter in Gufa and the judge that he was out collecting herbs? You know, it really doesn't matter what he was doing at the time. What matters is how he chose to react to what happened around him and when he saw the thieves and when he took the meat home and all these things. So it's just this idea of going, is this a, uh, an important part of the story or is it not? Does it help the reader to learn or understand the rest of the story? Or does, is it trivial? Does it not matter? Is it not helpful? And so that helps. Now, another way to look at inexpediency is someone did something in the story that was unhelpful. And I let them do that as well. So there's the character that says, okay, you know, I want to try and do this, but it doesn't, it doesn't serve their end means, you know, it's not a means to their end. Then they can use that as inexpediency. But the, the core of inexpediency is trying to find something that's unhelpful. And the, the, the reason I let them use either one is because it's a lot like inconsistency. It's you don't always have something mentioned in the story that you don't need. Like it depends on what they choose. If they're choosing a a fable, which I actually tell them most of the time they can't because a fable doesn't really give them enough to get all of these different you know, things refuted um, and give them enough practice. But if it's a shorter story and there's not really anything in there that doesn't need to be in there, then they go, well, I don't know what to do for an expediency. Well, most often there will be a character that does something that's really not helpful for themselves or for others. And so they can use that. The, the focus, right, is to give them an automatic recollection of tools they can pull out of their mind when they're in the middle of a conversation or when they're in the middle of speaking to people that they can say, what else can I show about this argument and how it is a false argument? That, I mean, that's, it's a very basic level, right? It's a very basic level of understanding, uh, refuting an argument at this point. Um, and it's for seventh grade. The last thing for epilogue, here's what I tell them, because there's always so many, uh, there's just so many ways to teach conclusions, right? And the, and the way that probably all of us have heard is, oh, you want to restate your main idea? I think that just kills people. I think it's boring and they've already heard it forever and it's just useless. I think it's inexpedient to just restate your main idea. And so um, what I tell the kids, I'm like, okay, you're trying to win an argument here. You're trying to convince someone of, someone of something that's so important that it could change their lives because of how they think or feel or act. And so if you're doing that, you want to pull in, and I let them do just one sentence if they want, because sometimes shorter and clearer is better, right? It just is. Short and clear and to the point usually packs more of a punch, right? And that's another thing seventh and eighth grade have to learn because they've read so much, they want to go and have all these beautiful flowing flowery words and they can't actually tell you what it really means, right? It sounds really great, but it doesn't really have a meaning. And so I say shorten it and, and make it clear and it can be just one sentence, but here's what you're doing with your audience at this time. You are leaving them, okay, with a strong statement. They won't forget that proves your point. And it's different than proving your point up here because up here, your point is very limited. You're saying this is inexpedient, this is improper, this is inconsistent, this is impossible. Down here, your point is here, right? 
you leave them with something they are not going to soon forget. It needs to pack a punch. It needs to be short. It needs to be powerful. And it needs to convince your audience that your thesis is right, right? That it holds water, that you've given all these reasons why it holds water, and now you've left them with something. I let my kids use quotes. You know, that's a really powerful way, especially if the quote is one that's um, often heard. Um, and it's a powerful quote that proves their thesis. And so that kind of goes back to tapping into the CREA because we pull out those quotes to be able to prove cause or, or converse in the CREA. Um, and so they've kind of done that before and they know how to do that. Um, I, but really, it doesn't even have to be a quote. It just needs to be a statement. A lot of times it can be a rhetorical question. I allow them to say that, you know. Uh, but it has to be one. A lot of times they'll have a great rhetorical question, but it doesn't actually prove their point up here from their thesis. So then we have to go back and say, uh, are you really proving what you claimed up here that people's minds are being twisted by this? Um, and if so, how are you doing that? So we would talk through this as a class, okay? And the kids would take notes. I would write a whole lot more on each section for them to write down in sentence format so that they're explaining to themselves because when they get home, they're gonna forget what in the world I said if I just do this, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, and then, okay, we would read through a story together, all right? And we're getting close to being time to done, but this is uh, the story of Chico and the Crane. And I don't know how many of you have read through it. It's one that uh, Selby has in his works, right? And the general idea of Chico and the Crane is there's this cook, and he gets a crane to uh, prepare for his uh, master, this nobleman, and he uh, prepares the crane, and it smells so good, and a young uh, peasant girl comes in and talks him into giving her a leg to eat. And she walks out, and she's happy, and he's happy, and then he presents the crane, and of course the nobleman's upset because it only has one leg. It makes him look like a fool. He gets on to uh, Chico, uh, the cook, and he says, well, didn't you know that cranes only have one leg? And he's like, okay, well, you know what? I'm not going to argue with you in front of my guests. We'll just go look tomorrow and see if cranes only have one leg. So they go out on this hunting, you know, expedition, and the cranes are all standing there asleep on one leg, right? And so Chico says, see, I told you, cranes only have one leg. And so then the nobleman says, you know, wakes them up, and they all put their second leg down and fly off. And he says, see there? See there? They have two legs. And Chico says, well, sire, if you had only clapped and whistled at the table, you would have seen the other leg come out, you know? And so then at the end, the, the nobleman says, oh, well, that's really funny. So I guess we'll just part as friends. I mean, and that's the end of the story. It's very, very, very short. But it's a great story for them to start on because um, it has some silly stuff in it. They enjoy it. And there's a lot of stuff you can pull out and say, hey, OK, it's unclear. OK, this is implausible. OK, why would a cook give you know, the, the piece of the crane to a girl knowing that he was probably going to get in trouble? Um, you know, it's impossible for, you know, whatever. So you're pulling things out. And they're, they're actually writing it. So in the same class period that I do this, we just throw out ideas as a whole class. What could this, OK, how could we make a general statement? All writers of fiction you know, sway young minds. OK, we've got a verb. We've got a statement. Now let's move in. Um, but the writer of Chico and the Crane, and you know, you're using heighteners kind of like in um, an encomium and invective, you might say. But the writer of Chico and the Crane deserves more punishment than all because he's the worst or whatever. So you're looking at um, your, your statements together and you let the kids do it. Like I wouldn't just throw out those ideas like I'm throwing them out to you. I would stop. I would wait. I would say, how do we do this? What should this sound like? If it's general and we can't even mention the, the name of the story, then how are we going to craft a, a strong verb and, and move it the way we want it to go? And and then a lot of times I'll have kids throw out several different suggestions. We'll put them on the board and we'll vote on which one we like the best and keep moving. So the first time we're kind of writing it together as a class. When we come back from that and they have their rough draft with all of these pieces and parts that we've talked through, then we start talking about uh, arrangement and elocution. Now the arrangement's easy because you can do it all in order. So you're not having to move things around necessarily, but arrangement within paragraphs is important and it's something that they don't always get. So then we look and we read, well, would this be better here? Does this sound better if we move this? Oh, you've got a dead word here, how can we fix it? Uh, and then we move on to elocution as far as um, grammar, style, spelling, adding in figures of description. But I do not do that all at once. First of all, you'd have to have a class period that lasted four hours, right? Okay. And secondly, it's too much for them to process at the same time. So it's like bits and pieces. Does that mean I'm spending a lot of time on one paper? Yes. And it's so worth it. 
it's so worth it. I haven't seen any any publications where I felt like I could write as many papers as they, as they expect you to with a class over the course of the year. But in my opinion, just like in literature, deeper is better than wider. And if they feel like they've gone through it well and they have something to show for it, they're ready to start on the next one. Um, they're kind of tired of this one after we've worked with it for so much. And otherwise, they're just completely and totally um, bombarded with all of the writing and, and it turns to get it done, get it done, get it done, get it done, get it turned in, get a grade for it, get it done, get it turned in, get a grade for it. I mean, there's something to be said for repetition. I wouldn't spend the whole year on one, right? Because they have to do the same things several times to get it. But I would say we probably do eight pieces a year, maybe nine at total. And, and we do them well, right? We sit and we look and we go back. I'll pull something out from November and say, okay, we wrote this way back here. What have you learned since then? How can you fix it since then? I keep everything. Um, I make copies of everything that they write. And so they get them back, of course, but I also keep it. Sometimes I require them to write it in cursive in their notebooks. Sometimes I require them to type it and that's just logistics so that they understand both ways and how to do it for when they get over here. Um, but a lot of times when I will copy them, I will cut them out and we will spend a day just looking at discredits and comparing each other's. So we move on to the next one after the one that we've done together, of course, then they get their own story and they have to figure it out on their own. And then we look at each other's. And so everybody has a copy. I do that all the time. If we're focusing in on, okay, nobody really gets inconsistency. So now I'm making copies of everybody's papers. I'm cutting out inconsistency. We're going to look at that and spend a whole class period on figuring out how to do this well. So, hey, thanks for giving me your time. Sorry, it feels like it just flew right by. And I know I'm a fast talker. Um, so I hope that you could follow a little bit. And I hope you got a couple of tips. The other, the other thing I wanted to share before you go um, is you do have some extra handouts that I didn't talk about today. But um, Erasmus and just some fun, creative kind of writing activities. If you haven't read his On Copia of Words and Ideas, you should do it. It's a huge part of making your writing beautiful, right? And helping kids come up with, uh, invent, you know, inventing things to write about. And these are the two books that I generally use to pull stories out of for this seventh grade to refute and to confirm. So there's just a ton of great stories in here where they, they get to pick their own. Because after we do one together, I want them to choose their own so they can, they can start reading on their own and figuring it out on their own. Um, so if you just wanted ideas of books that they're really easy things to pull from, that's that. And that's all I can really think of that I brought today. If you have any questions or anything to share with me to make me better, I would love to hear it to have to pick out the part that they think is unclear. And I don't make them use it in order like he does. So if he says, OK, unclarity happens in the first paragraph. So let's look at the first paragraph and talk about what's unclear about this paragraph. I don't give them that. I make them think through that. So I, it, they can pick out something that's unclear that's at the end of the story. Okay. Because essentially, they're just looking for a way to use the tool. And it doesn't matter where it happens in the story, you know, really. And that's real life. You know, They're not going to have something set up in a situation where they can go, oh, well, something's unclear. And I have to find that before I can find something that's implausible, which will be next. And something that, that never happens, right? So it's just, I don't, ever, I don't ever walk them through, here's a section and now you rewrite it. And here's a section and now you write it in your own. I don't do that. I say, read the story, pick out something that you think is unclear and prove to me why it's unclear. So it doesn't have to be in that order. They could talk about something that happens at the end here. They could talk about something in the middle at the, at the beginning. It doesn't matter to me as long as it makes sense. Because they've already told the story in order up here. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So they actually don't use these books at all. Um, I use them to help me remember things if I forget now. How do I say that or what do I want to do? So it's just a teaching tool for me. So they don't, they don't go through that. It's all in their notebooks, which I think is super helpful. I think putting something in front of them that has all these different steps and do this in here and it's just confusing. So you don't super confusing. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I use all of those pieces yeah. and I say, boy, okay. You're making a claim here. What would be a really good way to say this and not, it kind of fits in with this idea of avoiding the dead words. So I say, how can you do this without a dead word? Well, I could ask a question. Oh, that's a great, great idea. What kind of question could you ask? Well, it's kind of a rhetorical question because then, okay, now how would they fit? So I kind of just have the conversation. It's dialectic. We're teaching dialectic. It has to be a conversation. I have to get them to ask the question in their mind before it does them any good anyway. So just, uh, it feels, it's, it's a lot less mechanical. It's a lot more of a conversation during the class period the whole time. Like, you know, what sounds good here? Why does it sound good? 
you know, how does this make sense? What do you need here? Well, you haven't said that there's a possibility that somebody else might think this way and then proved that wrong. Oh, yeah, that's a counterclaim. Okay, how could we do that in there? So I don't, if they have those components, I don't care if it's exactly this and this and this and this and this. What I care about is they understand what the terms mean and how to use them. Does that make sense? Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to do it that way, but it seems a lot more manageable to me. It is. Yes, yes. There is a book. I would start. Well, it depends on how philosophical or practical you want to be in your reading at first. There's a book. I'm trying to remember the name of it right now by George A. Kennedy. And it's a translation by George Kennedy. And it's on the Pro Gymnosmata. And if you just Google Pro Gymnosmata and George Kennedy, it'll come up. It's the only one by him on it. And it talks about now there's these four. Um, ancient Greek teachers of the progymnosmata, right? They've, there's Theon and there's Aphthonius and these, these four guys. And he actually goes through and explains, here's how they actually did it, and here's what they actually used, and here's what it looks like. And so it gives you kind of an overall view of what progym is and what we're trying to do with it. This is just a teeny tiny little piece in that whole succession. Right? So there's, there's things that are happening before the kids get this, and there's things that are happening after. But that book right there gives you a great overview of ProGym itself. Okay? There's, there's, there's a lot of practical, but there's also a lot of philosophical. And there's one part on even how to teach it all. Um, so that's a good one. And then, then the other one that I do use is the classical composition. And I would recommend getting. Yes, it's right here. You can look at it. I would recommend getting one of each, depending on how many you're, you're doing, but just for your own use, a teacher edition of each of his steps because it gives you so many ideas, right? It can be very overwhelming for the students, but for the teacher, it just, it's just a treasure trove of ideas. Any, anything else? I hope I haven't bored you. I appreciated your lovely logical comments at the beginning. I thought, boy, he's not one of my seventh graders. <laughs> but you're right. <laughs>